talk about uh, learning and, uh, and, and intelligence. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started on chapter 6, learning uh, reflex or instinct. Uh, birds build nests in the spring and migrate as winter approaches. Uh, infants suckle at their mother's breast. Dogs shake water off their wet fur. Is it reflex or instinct? Uh, salmon swim upstream to spawn. Spiders spin intricate webs. All the previous examples are unlearned behaviors. Both instincts and reflexes are innate. They're unlearned behaviors that organisms are born with. Reflexes are a motor or neural reaction to a specific stimulus in the environment. They tend to be simpler than instincts, involve the activity of specific body parts and systems, for example, the knee-jerk reflex, uh, the contraction of the pupil in bright light, uh, and involve more primitive centers of the central nervous system, for example, the spinal cord and the medulla. Instincts are innate behaviors that are triggered by a broader range of events, such as maturation and the change of seasons. The more complex patterns of behavior involving movements of the organism as a whole, for example, sexual activity and migration, and involve higher brain centers. Both reflexes and instincts help an organism adapt to its environment and do not have to be learned. For example, every healthy human baby has a sucking reflex present at birth. Babies are born knowing how to suck on a nipple, whether artificial, from a bottle, or on a human. Learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior and knowledge that results from experience. In contrast to the innate behaviors discussed above, learning involves acquiring knowledge and skills through experience. Learning has traditionally been studied in terms of its simplest components, and the associations of our minds automatically make between uh, events. Our minds have a natural tendency to connect events that occur closely together or in sequence. Associative learning occurs when an organism makes connections between stimuli or events that occur together in the environment. In classical conditioning, also known as Pavlovian conditioning, Organisms learn to associate events or stimuli that repeatedly happen together. Classical conditioning is a process by which we learn to associate stimuli and, consequently, to anticipate events. And, of course, this is the original uh, experiment by Pavlov. Pavlov was a gastroenterologist. He was studying uh, stomach juices. And what he proved was, well, that uh, the dogs will salivate when they're given food, but then he started ringing a bell when he, started, when he fed the dogs. Pretty soon, he, the dogs would salivate when he rang the bell, whether the food was there or not. And that was the, uh, that's how he conditioned the dog to respond to the bell. You have a cat named Tiger who is quite spoiled. You keep her food in a separate cabinet, and you also have a special electric can opener that you use only to open cans of cat food. For every meal, Tiger hears the distinctive sound of the electric can opener and then gets her food. Tiger quickly learns that when she hears the can opener, she is about to get food. When Tiger hears the electric can opener, she will likely get excited and run to where you are preparing the food. And there's the can openers. <laughs> okay. In classical conditioning, the initial period of learning is known as acquisition. When an organism learns to connect a neutral uh, stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. During acquisition, the neutral stimulus begins to elicit the conditioned response, and eventually the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus, capable of eliciting the conditioned response by itself. Timing is important for conditioning to occur. Typically, there should only be a brief interval between presentation of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Taste aversion is a type of conditioning in which an interval of several hours may pass between the conditioned stimulus, 
something ingested, and the unconditioned stimulus, nausea, or illness. The individual becomes instantly averse uh, to the food. And, of course, this happened to me once upon a time. That's why I have the uh, corn chips here. Uh, my, my first wife made uh, uh, a taco hamburger helper. And it was good. I ate it the, that night. But there was something wrong with the hamburger. And after that, of course, if you remember Hamburger Helper from the 1970s, uh, it was uh, it was ham it was uh, corn chips uh, with uh, with chili sauce on top, and that was the Taco Hamburger Helper. Anyway, the next day I got really really sick, and it was probably from the hamburger. It could have been from the tomato sauce in the in the Hamburger Helper, but I got really sick, and at, and since then I haven't been able to eat corn chips because. That was the flavor that uh, I remembered uh, eating and that I tasted coming back up when I got sick uh, at work the next morning. It was uh, food poisoning. Once upon a time, oh, that's that's the, the, whole, uh, the whole story of El Paso Hamburger Helper, Crunchy Taco, and it, well, I got sick. I got so sick. Um... And that's the story. Okay, I already told you the story. And there's corn chips. It really didn't make any difference. That's what the, it was. Hamburger Helper, and it was really, it wasn't the Hamburger Helper's fault. It's probably the hamburger's fault. But uh, of course, after that, I couldn't eat corn chips at all. Just thinking about them, especially tortilla chips. Anyway, how does this occur? How does taste aversion occur? Conditioning based on a single instance and involving an extended time lapse between the event and the negative stimulus? Research into taste aversion suggests that this response may be an evolutionary adaptation designed to help organisms quickly learn to avoid harmful foods. Pavlov explored a scenario in his experiments with dogs where he, he attempted to stop the conditioned response. He stopped pairing the unconditioned stimulus with the conditioned stimulus. Soon the dog stopped responding to the tone. And this is known as extinction. Extinction is the de decrease in the conditioned response when the unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented with the conditioned stimulus. Pavlov's, Pavlov was not done after the extinguished uh, after he extinguished the conditioned stimulus, he reintroduced it after a period of time. To his surprise, there was no period of learning. The dog immediately responded to the old conditioned stimulus. This Pavlov called spontaneous recovery. Let me give you a tragic example from my own life. Once upon a time, I was married to a woman who tried to poison me with ta ta taco hamburger helper. Because I am boring and uncool, she decided that she would rather be around other men than live with me and her two children. She left us and moved back home. I was stationed in Lubbock, Texas at the time. Her messing around really bothered me. The word for it is cuckolding, and just saying the word brings, uh, brings winks and nods from everyone but the cuckolded man. After six months, she called and wanted to come back because she missed me and the kids so much. Did I remember all the heartache and lonely nights that she caused? Did I remember all the heartache and lonely nights that she caused? No. All I remembered was all the good times we had and how we were happy once struggling through life with our two children. Spontaneous recovery. Not to worry, neither of us had changed. I was still a boring and uncool as I had been before. She was still looking for more excitement than an ugly man and two children can provide. This time she ran off with my best friend who drove a sports car. She no longer had to ride in my family station wagon. And everybody turned out happy. And I stayed single for, f for five years. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Sometimes we just do the dumbest things, don't we? Stimulus discrimination. When I go to the, a restaurant, I order Mountain Dew. If they have Coke products instead of Pepsi, they always offer me Mellow Yellow. The two are the same color and have similar tastes, but anyone who is an aficionado of uh, Mountain Dew can tell the difference by the smell, not alone the taste. And this is stimulus discrimination. No mellow yellow for me, 
even though it looks the same, kind of almost just about tastes the same, I can't stand Mellow Yellow. Back in the day, in 1980s, they had cola wars. Pepsi would try to outsell Coke by lowering their prices. RC Cola sometimes got involved, so you never knew what cola you were getting if it was a fountain drink. But the three colas don't taste alike, and eventually people started asking for Pepsi or Coke. People had just had developed stimulus discrimination with colas, and I can, I can, I'll tell you, the uh, RC Cola has a very distinctive flavor. At least I think so. And Pepsi and Coke certainly don't taste alike. Of course, not everyone cared to participate in the Cola Wars, so they drank whatever was served, saying things like, they all taste alike. I can't tell the difference anyway, so just give me a Cola. This was stimulus generalization. If it's Cola, it tastes the same. John B. Watson is considered the founder of behaviorism. Behaviorism is, is a school of thought that arose during the first part of the 20th century, which incorporates elements of Pavlov's classical conditioning. This was in stark contrast with Freud, who considered the reasons for behavior to be hidden in the unconscious. Watson championed the idea that all behavior can be studied as a simple stimulus-response reaction, without regard for internal processes. Watson argued that in order for psychology to become a legitimate science, it must shift its concern away from internal mental processes and become, because mental processes cannot be seen or measured. Instead, he asserted that psychology must focus on outward ob observable behavior that can be measured. According to Watson, human behavior, just like animal behavior, is primarily the result of conditioned responses. Whereas Pavlov's work with dogs involved the conditioning of reflexes, Watson believed the same principles could be extended to the conditioning of human emotions. Through experiments, Watson demonstrated how fears can be conditioned. And this is John B. Watson right here. This is a baby. And this baby used to love to play with the, with the bunny rabbits. He even played with lab rats. He just thought they were the coolest things in the world. So John B. Watson decided he would experiment with this baby, baby Alfred. And uh, he would, uh, anytime he touched anything furry, he would clang a bar behind his head. And pretty soon he conditioned him to be deathly afraid of anything with fur, even the bunny rabbit. As you can see, the baby is scared scared to death of the rabbit. Uh, it got so bad that the uh, uh, baby would respond to his mother's uh, fur collar. Uh, he would start crying if the mother tried to pick him up when she was wearing the, uh, a coat with a fur, fur collar. And unfortunately, her winter coat had a fur collar, so she had to buy a new coat. Uh, and, and the strange thing is that Watson never decondi uh, deconditioned the, the, uh, the child. And baby Alfred grew up with a fear of fur. Psychologist B.F. Skinner saw that classical conditioning is limited to existing behaviors that are reflexively el elicited. And it doesn't account for new behaviors such as riding a bike. Skinner believed that behavior is motivated by the consequences we, we receive for the behavior, the reinforcements and punishments. This idea that learning is the result of consequences is based on the law of effect, which was first proposed by psychologist Edward Thorndike. According to the law of effect, behaviors that are followed by consequences that are satisfying to the organism are more likely to be repeated. And behaviors that are followed by unpleasant consequences are less likely to be rep repeated. Essentially, if an organism does something that brings about a desired result, the organism is more likely to do it again. If an organism does something that does not bring about a desired result, the organism is less likely to do it again. Skinner began conditioning scientific experiments on animals, mainly rats and pigeons, to determine how organisms learn through operant conditioning. He placed these animals inside an operant conditioning chamber, which has come to be known as a Skinner box. And this is a Skinner box. All the rat has to do is push the lever and he gets a food pellet. A Skinner box, oh, that, wait, I've already talked about that. 
Okay, speakers and lights can be associated with certain behaviors. A recorder counts the number of responses made by the animal, and this is just repeating the same thing over and over again. It's not him. <laughs> Actually, get he would be as fat as a toad. In opera conditioning, positive and negative do not mean good and bad. Instead, positive means you are adding something, and negative means you are taking something away. Reinforcement means you are increasing a behavior, and punishment means you are decreasing a behavior. Reinforcement can be positive or negative, and punishment can also be positive or negative. All reinforcers, positive or negative, increase the likelihood of a, behavior, a behavioral response. All punishers, positive or negative, decrease the likelihood of a behavioral response. Negative reinforcement strengthen a behavior that avoids or removes negative outcome. Okay. Positive reinforcement, something is added to increase the likelihood of a behavior. Positive reinforcement. Good grade, she got a treat. Uh, okay, I'm not sure what the dog did to get the treat, but uh, he got the, the treat. Positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement, something is removed to increase the likelihood of a behavior. You can't play until you clean your room. Positive punishment, something is added to uh, decrease the likelihood of a behavior. In this case, the something that is added is the scolding. So he scolds him, and, and now he's not going to shoe boots anymore. Negative punishment, uh, something is removed to decrease the likelihood of a behavior. If you don't clean your room, I'll throw away all your toys and cancel the trip to Disneyland. The best way to teach a person or an animal a behavior is use positive reinforcement. When an organism receives a reinforcer, each time it displays a behavior, it is called continuous reinforcement. Once a behavior is trained, researchers and trainers often turn to another type of reinforcement schedule, a partial reinforcement. In partial reinforcement, also referred to as intermittent reinforcement, the person or animal does not get reinforced every time they perform the desired behavior. There are several different types of partial reinforcement schedules. These schedules are described as either fixed or variable, and as either interval or ratio. Fixed refers to the number of responses between reinforcements, or the amount of time between reinforcements, which is set and unchanging. Variable refers to the number of responses or amount of time between reinforcements, which varies or changes. Interval means that the schedule is based on the time between reinforcements, and ratio means that the schedule is based on the number of responses between reinforcements. A fixed interval reinforcement schedule is when behavior is rewarded after a set amount of time. Fixed interval. After major surgery, a patient is given an IV drip with patient-controlled painkiller. The doctor sets a limit, one dose per hour. If the patient pushes the button uh, a dozen times, they still only receive a single dose of medication. Since a reward only occurs on a fixed interval, there is no point in exhibiting the behavior since it will not be rewarded. With a variable interval reinforcement schedule, the person or animal gets the reinforcement based on varying amounts of time, which are uh, un unpredictable, and that's what's happening here. You never know when you're going to catch a fish. Bill loved to ski, but only when there was fresh powder. It was too icy otherwise. Sometimes Bill was able to ski every weekend, and other winters it was five or six weeks uh, between skiing expeditions. Variable interval reinforcement. Fixed ratio reinforcement. With a fixed ratio reinforcement schedule, there are a set number of responses that must occur before the behavior is rewarded. Fixed ratio reinforcement. Uh, if I get $1,000 every two weeks and I take $100 of that and buy a savings bond, I am being paid and buying savings bonds on a fixed ratio schedule. Variable ratio reinforcement. Uh, in a variable rate ratio reinforcement schedule, the number of responses needed for a reward varies. This is the most powerful partial 
reinforcement schedule. And this is what uh, uh, casino uh, jackpot things, the casino instrument. What is that thing? One arm bandit. That's, they they don't pay off uh, at a certain number of uh, of times. You might you might uh, put in a quarter and get a uh, hundred dollars out, and then put in another quarter and get a hundred dollars out, and then it may take you you know five hundred quarters to get the next hundred dollars out. An example of the variable ratio reinforcement schedule is gambling. Gamblers pump quarters into slot machines. That's what it was all night without a pay payout. Because the reinforce of the reinforce because the reinforcement schedule in most types of gambling is a variable ratio schedule, people keep trying and hoping that the next time they will win big. This is one of the reasons that gambling is so addictive and so resistant to extinction. Because sometimes you actually win. It only takes one. You're right. That's what makes people uh, buy tickets for the the lottery when there's a billion dollars involved. You never know. <laughs> it's a one in a billion shot. But hey, you could be that one in a billion. In operant conditioning, extinction of a reinforced behavior occurs at some point after reinforcement stops. And the speed at which this happens depends on the reinforcement schedule. In a variable ratio schedule, the point of extinction comes very slowly. But in other reinforcement schedules, extinction may come very quickly. Strict behaviorists like Watson and, and Skinner focused exclusively on studying behavior rather than cognition, such as thoughts and expectations. In fact, Skinner was such a staunch believer that cognition didn't matter that his ideas were considered radical behaviorism. Skinner considered the, the mind a black box, something completely unknowable, and therefore something not to be studied. Behavior Edward, behaviorist Edward C. Tolman had a different opinion. Tolman's experiments with rats demonstrated that organisms can learn even if they do not receive immediate reinforcement. This finding was in conflict with the prevailing idea at the time that reinforcement must be immediate in order for learning to occur, thus suggesting a cognitive aspect to learning. Tolman placed hungry rats in a maze with no reward for finding their way through it. He also studied a comparison group that was rewarded with food at the end of the maze. As the unreinforced rats explored the maze, they developed a cognitive map, a mental picture of the layout of the, ma of the maze. After 10 sessions in the maze without reinforcement, food was placed in a goal box at the end of the maze. As soon as the rats became aware of the food, they were able to find their way through the maze quickly, just as quickly as the comparison group, which had been rewarded with food all along. This is known as latent learning, learning that occurs but is not observable in behavior until there is a reason to demonstrate it. So we don't know what's there until, until it's demonstrated. Latent means... Uh, Delayed. And there you go. He's trying to find the food. There you got it. Good job. Let's do it again. Okay, there we go. Ugh, rodents. Not my favorite. Latent learning also occurs in humans. Children may learn by watching the actions of their parents, but only demonstrate it at a later date when they learned material, when the learned material is needed. And observ observational learning, we learn by watching others and then imitating or modeling what they do or say. The individuals performing the, imi uh, the imitated behavior are called models. Research suggests that this imitative learning involves a specific type of neuron called a mirror neuron. Psychologist Albert Bandura, psychologist Albert Bandura's ideas about learning were different from those of strict behaviorists. Bandura proposed a brand of behaviorism called social learning theory, which took cognitive processes into account. 
Bandura felt that internal mental states must ha have a role in learning and that observational learning involves much more than, than imitation. And, oops, I'm sorry, I was meant to go the other way. This is Bandura's experiment. Uh, Bandura had uh, children, very relatively young children, as you can see. She's only three or four years old. Uh, she had them observing uh, uh, adults playing with toys. And this adult hit a, uh, this is a Bozo the Clown, and she hit it with a mallet. And so when the girl got a chance to play with the to same toys the adult was playing with, there she is slamming the Bozo the Clown with the mallet. And strangely enough, I used to have one of these toys when I was three or four years old. For some reason, my mother wanted to teach me how to box. Uh, and if you punch this, uh, this thing in the nose, it had sand in the bottom, so it always came back up. Anyway, we had lots of fun with that thing, punching it in the nose and knocking it down, and it would come back and hit us back. It's really kind of interesting. According to LaFrancois in 2012, there are several ways that observational learning can occur. You learn a new response. You choose whether or not to imitate the model, depending on what you saw happen to the model. Uh, you learn a general rule that you can apply to other situations. And there you go. We have two heme in there. Bandura identified three kinds of models, live, verbal, and symbolic. Uh, I live, a live model demonstrates a behavior in person. A verbal instructional uh, model does not perform the behavior, but instead explains or describes a behavior. A symbolic model can be fictional characters or real people who demonstrate behaviors in books, movies, television shows, video games, or internet sources. And there you go. Popeye the Sailor Man. He am what he am. I am disgustipated. I had a friend, I had a student that was telling me that, uh, that he could kill a grizzly bear by jumping up and stabbing it through the skull, the top of the skull, with a bowie knife. And, uh, I was, and, and he swore that he knew that he could do this. He knew that he could do this. And what he was talking about was, and of course, this was in Montana, and uh, he was saying that he could, uh, he could kill a grizzly bear by stabbing it through the, the top of the skull, jumping up, stabbing it through the top of the skull with a bowie knife. Now, what he was actually talking about was the fact that he had been able to do it in a video game. And because he did it in a video game, he thought he could do it in real life, as bizarre as that may seem. Now, now this is Montana. Grizzly bears are like 12 feet tall, so the probability of him actually being able to do that was really, really remote. The bear would never let him get that close before it uh, destroyed him. Bandura describes specific steps in the process of modeling that must be followed if learning is to be successful. Attention, retention, reproduction, and motivation. You must be focused on what the model is doing. You have to pay attention. You must be able to retain or remember what you observed, and this is retention. You must be able to perform the behavior that you observed and committed to memory, and this is reproduction. And you must be motivated to do all of those things. You must be focused on what the model is doing. You have to pay attention. Focus. You must be able to retain or remember what you observed. This is retention. You must be able to perform the behavior that you observed and committed to memory. This is reproduction. You must have motivation. One needs to want to copy the behavior, and whether or not one is motivated depends on what happened to the model. If the model was reinforced, one will be more motivated to copy them. This is known as vicarious reinforcement. If you observe the model being punished, you would be less motivated to copy that. This is called vicarious punishment. 
Bandura conducted an experiment with five-foot inflatable Bobo doll, and that's the doll we saw before. I called it Bozo. I, yeah, maybe it was Bobo. In the experiment, children's aggressive behavior was influenced by whether the teacher was punished for her behavior. In one scenario, a teacher acted aggressively with the doll, hitting, throwing, and even punching the doll while a child watched. There were two types of responses by the children to the teacher's behavior. When the teacher was punished for her bad behavior, the children decreased their tendency to act, to act as she did. When the teacher was praised or ignored and not punished for her behavior, the children imitated what she did and even what she said. This is a Bobo Smackdown. There you go. My hair goes Bobo again. A segment you were about to see is taken from an early experiment on learning of, the, of the aggressive styles of uh, behavior uh, through modeling. Uh, children uh, watched a, uh, a filmed adult uh, perform novel aggressive acts toward a uh, inflated doll. And the physical aggression was um, accompanied by uh, novel, uh, hostile uh, remarks. We later measured how much of this uh, modeled aggression the children had learned uh, just by uh, watching. Now, the measurement uh, of uh, learning of aggression uh, uses uh, simulated targets rather than uh, live ones. Uh, for example, uh, to test how well bombardiers have uh, learned uh, you know, bombing strategies, uh, you would use uh, simulated targets rather than require them to uh, bomb San Francisco or uh, New York. The uh, model pummeled the doll with the mallet, flung it in the air, Kicked it repeatedly. Threw it down and beat it. Its nose honks. That's why she's hitting it in the nose. I have three brothers. We used to do this all the time. <laughs> to our, and I, it was my Bobo. Or Bozo. I thought it was Bozo. It was once widely believed that seeing others land aggression would drain the viewer's aggressive drive. As you can see, exposure to aggressive modeling is hardly cathartic. Could be more fun. Exposure to aggressive modeling increased attraction to guns, even though it was never modeled. Guns had less appeal to children who had no exposure to the aggressive modeling. The children also picked up the novel hostile language. Mean-looking kid, isn't it? Hmm. Sugar and spice, everything nice. Oh, wait a minute, maybe not. Throw it. There you go. The room contained very play material. Okay. That was exciting. Okay. That was actually Albert Bandura.
And that's the end of that chapter. So let's go on to the next chapter, Thinking and Intelligence. Oh, this looks like artificial intelligence to me. <clears throat> Cognitive psychology is the field of psychology dedicated to examining how people think. It attempts to explain how and why we think the way that we do by studying the interactions among human thinking, emotional, emotion, creativity, language, and problem solving, in addition to other cognitive processes. Cognitive psychologists strive to determine and measure different types of intelligence, why some people are better at working uh, problem solving than others, and how the emotional intelligence affects success in the workplace, among countless other topics. They also sometimes focus on how we organize thoughts and information gathered from our environments into meaningful categories of thoughts, which will be discussed later. Human nervous system the human nervous system is capable of handling endless streams of information. When thoughts are formed, the mind synthesizes information from emotions and memories. Emotion and memory are powerful influences on both our thoughts and behaviors. In order to organize the staggering amount of information, the mind has developed a file cabinet of sorts in the mind. The different files stored in the file cabinet are called concepts. Concepts are categories or groupings of linguistic information, images, ideas, or memories, such as life experiences. Concepts are, in many ways, big ideas that are generated by observing details and categorizing and combining these details into cognitive structures. You use concepts to see the relationships uh, among the different elements of your experiences and to keep the information in your mind organized and accessible. Another technique used by your brain to organize information is the identification of prototypes for the concept you have developed. A prototype is the best example or representation of a concept. This is the dog prototype. This is a dog exemplar. This is Duchess the Chihuahua. She's about one one hundredth of this dog. And that's another dog. And of course, when you think of dog, you don't think of this dog. This is a, uh, a Mexican hairless. Oops, I went back to... Ch oh, there's another dog. And there's the dog running around at Westminster. In psychology, concepts can be divided into two categories, natural and artificial. Natural concepts are created naturally through your experiences and can be developed through from either direct or indirect experiences. An artificial concept, on the other hand, is a concept that is defined by a specific set of characteristics. Various properties of geometric shapes, like squares and triangles, serve as uh, useful examples of artificial concepts. A triangle always has three angles and three sides. A square always has four equal sides and four right angles. Artificial concepts can, be, uh, can enhance the understanding of a topic by building one uh, on one another. Concepts act as building blocks and can be connected in countless combinations to create complex thoughts. Do you want me to put the chart on one page, which would make the text too small for your audience to see? Or do you prefer a multiple page approach that is confusing and, and uh, unpersuasive? It's probably better if no one can read it. I won't bother using real words. A schema is a mental construct consisting of a cluster or a collection of related concepts. There are many different types of schemata, and they all have one thing in common. Schemata are a method of organizing information that allows the brain to work more efficiently. When a schema is activated, the brain makes immediate assumptions about the person or object being observed.
Whoops. A role, uh, a role schema makes assumptions about how individuals in certain roles will behave. For example, imagine you meet someone who introduces himself as a firefighter. When this happens, your brain automatic, uh, automatically activates the firefighter schema and begins making assumptions that this person is brave, selfless, and community-oriented. An event schema, also known as a cognitive script, is a set of behaviors that can feel like a routine. Think about what you do uh, when you walk into an elevator. First, the doors open and you wait to let uh, exiting passengers leave the elevator car. Then you step into the elevator and turn around to face the doors, looking for the correct button to push. You never face the back of the elevator, do you? Except in this case, he's facing the wrong direction. Language is a communication system that involves using words and systematic rules to organize those words to transmit information from one individual to another. While language is a form of communication, not all communication is language. Many species communicate with one another through their postures, movements, odors, or vocalizations. This communication is crucial for the species. Language has specific components, a lexicon and grammar. Lexicon refers to the words of a given language. Thus, lexicon is a language's vocabulary. Grammar refers to the set of rules that are used to convey meaning through the use of the lexicon. Words are formed by combining the various phonemes that make up the language. A phoneme, uh, uh, an example of the sound ah versus eh, is a basic sound unit of a given language, and different languages have different sets of phonemes. Phonemes are combined to form morphemes, which are the smallest units of language that convey some type of meaning. For example, I is both a phoneme and a morpheme. We, we use semantics and syntax to construct language. Semantics and syntax are part of a language's grammar. Semantics refers to the process by which we derive meaning from morphemes and, or, and words. Syntax refers to the way words are organized into sentences. We apply the rules of grammar to organize the lexicon in novel and creative ways which allow us to communicate information about both concrete and abstract concepts. Through our use of words and language, we are able to form, organize, and express ideas, schema, and artificial concepts. B.F. Skinner in 1957 proposed that language is learned through reinforcement. Noam Chomsky in, in 1965 criticized this behaviorist approach, asserting instead that the mechanisms underlying language acquisition are biologically determined. The use of language develops in the absence of formal instruction and appears to follow a very similar pattern in children from vastly different cultures and backgrounds. It would seem, therefore, that we are born with a biological predisposition disposition to acquire a language. And this is a picture of Noam Chomsky, and he is still alive, strangely enough. It appears that there is a critical period for language acquisition, such that this pro uh, proficiency at acquiring language is maximal early in life. Generally, as people age, the ease with which they acquire and master new languages diminishes. Use it or lose it. Children begin to learn about language from a very early age. It appears that this uh, is occurring even before we are born. Newborns show preference for their mother's voice and appear to be able to discriminate between the language spoken by their mother and other languages. Babies are also attuned to the languages being used around them and show preferences for videos of faces that are moving in synchrony with the audio or spoken language versus videos that do not synchronize with the audio. Each language has its own, way, its own set of phonemes that are used to generate morphemes and words. Babies can discriminate among the sounds that make up a language. For example, they can tell the difference between the S in vision and the S in fission. 
Early on, they can differentiate between the sounds of all human languages, even those that do not occur in the languages that are used in the environments. However, by the time uh, that they are about one year old, they can only discriminate among those phonemes that are used in the language or languages in their environments. After the uh, first uh, few months of life, babies enter what is known as the babbling stage, during the, uh, which time they tend to produce uh, single syllables that are repeated over and over. As time passes, more variations appear in the syllables that they produce. During this time, it is unlikely that the babies are trying to communicate. They're just likely to babble when they are alone as when they are with their caregivers. Interestingly, babies who are raised in, the, uh, in environments in which sign language is used will also begin to show babbling in the gestures of their hands during the stage. And this is actually quite interesting. No, I can't do it. Okay. Generally, a child's first word is uttered sometimes, sometimes uh, between the ages of one year and or 18 months. And for the next few months, the child will remain in the one-word stage of language development. During this time, children know a number of words, but they only produce one-word utterances. The child's early vocabulary is limited to uh, familiar objects or events, often nouns. Although children in this stage only make one-word utterances, these words often carry larger meanings. As a child's lexicon grows, they begin, she, she begins to utter simple sentences and to acquire new vocabulary at a very rapid pace. In addition, children begin to demonstrate a clear understanding of the, the specific rules that apply to their languages. Even the mistakes that children sometimes make provide evidence of just how much they understand about these, those rules. This is sometimes seen in the form of overgeneralization. In this context, overgeneralization refers to an extension of a language rule to an, exceptional, uh, an, uh, an exception to that rule. The given language that children learn is connected to their culture and surroundings. Psychologists have long investigated the question of whether language shapes thoughts and actions or whether our thoughts and beliefs shape our language. Today, psychologists continue to study and debate the relationship between language and thought. Language may indeed influence the way that we think, an idea known as linguistic determinism. One uh, recent demonstration of this phenomenon involved uh, differences in the way that English and Mandarin Chinese speakers think and uh, talk and think about time. English speakers tend to talk about time uh, using terms that describe changes along a horizontal dimension. Mandarin Chinese speakers also describe time in horizontal terms. It is not uncommon to also use terms associated with a vertical arrangement. For example, the past might be described as being up and the future as being down. It turns out that these differences in language translate only differences in performance on cognitive tests uh, into differences in cog. It turns out that these differences in language translate into differences in performance on cognitive tests designed to measure how quickly an individual can recognize temporal relationships. Specifically, when given a series of tasks with vertical priming. Mandarin Chinese speakers were faster at recognizing, temp recognizing temporal relationships between months. Boroditsky uh, in 2001 sees these results as suggesting that habits in language encourage habits in thought. When you are presented with a problem, before finding a solution to the problem, the problem must first be clearly identified. After that, one of many problem-solving strategies can be applied, hopefully resulting in a solution. A problem-solving strategy is a plan of action used to find a solution. Different strategies have different action plans associated with them. A well-known strategy is trial and error. 
The old adage, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, describes trial and error. When using trial and error, you would continue to try different solutions until you solved your problem. Although trial and error is not typically one of the most time-efficient strategies, it is a, it is a, communi a commonly used one. <clears throat> An algorithm is a problem-solving formula that provides you with the step-by-step -step instructions used to achieve a desired outcome. And this is according to Kahneman in 2011. You can think of an algorithm as a recipe with highly de detailed instructions that produce the same result every time they are performed. Algorithms are used frequently in our everyday lives, especially in computer science. When you run a search on the internet, search engines like Google use algorithms to decide which entries will appear first in your list of results. A heuristic is a general problem-solving framework. Think of heuristics as uh, mental shortcuts that are used to solve problems. A rule of thumb is an example of a heuristic. Such a rule saves the person time and energy when making a decision. But despite this, its time-saving characteristics, it is not always the best method for making a rational decision. The impulse to use a heuristic occurs when one of five conditions is met. When one is faced with too much information, when at the time to make a decision is limited, uh, when the decision to be made is un unimportant, uh, when there is access to very little information to use in making the decision, and when an appropriate heuristic happens to come uh, to mind in the same moment. Working backwards is a useful heuristic in which you begin solving the problem by focusing on the end result. You use the working backwards heuristic to plan the events of your day on a regular basis, probably without even thinking about it. Another useful heuristic is the practice of accomplishing a large goal or task by breaking it into a series of smaller steps. The large task becomes less overwhelming when it is broken down into a series of small steps. Albert Einstein once said, Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. A mental set is where you persist in approaching a problem in a way that has worked in the past but is clearly not working now. <laughs> Functional fixedness is a type of mental set where you cannot perceive an object being used for something other than what it was designed for. German and, and Barrett in 2005 determined that functional fixedness is experienced in both industrialized and non-industrialized cultures. The dog was done with it, so we popped it on and filled, and, and filled it with cereal. Well, that makes a lot of sense. In order to make good decisions, we use our knowledge and our reasoning. Often this knowledge and reasoning is sound and solid. Sometimes, however, we are swayed by the biases by others uh, manipulating a situation. An anchoring bias occurs when you focus on one piece of information when making a decision or solving a problem. The confirmation bias is the tendency to focus on information that confirms your existing beliefs. Hindsight bias leads you to believe that the event you just experienced was predictable, even though it really wasn't. In other words, you knew all along that things would turn out the way they did. Representative bias describes a faulty way of thinking in which you unintentionally stereotype someone or something. The availability heuristic is a heuristic in which you make a decision based on an example, information, or recent experience that is, uh, that is that readily available to you, even though it may not be the best example uh, to inform your decision. Biases tend to preserve that that which is already established to maintain our pre-existing knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, and hypotheses. Did you read my paper on confirmation bias? Yes, but it only proved what I already knew. Confirmation bias. That's funny. 
There are several theories of intelligence. Charles Spearman felt that there is a basic underlying factor in intelligence, which encompasses broad reasoning and problem solving. This Spearman called G for general intelligence. Spearman denotes specific intelligence by referring to S. Spearman also developed a way of statistically proving that intelligence could be measured using factor analysis. In the 1940s, Raymond Cattell proposed a theory of intelligence that divided general intelligence into two components, crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence is characterized as acquired knowledge and the, the ability to retrieve it. When you learn, remember, and recall information, you are using crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence encompasses the ability to see complex relationships and solve problems. Fluid intelligence helps you uh, tackle complex, abstract challenges in your daily life, whereas crystallized intelligence helps you overcome <laughs> concrete, straightforward problems. <laughs> Cattell, 1963. I never actually saw this before. I, okay, he thinks he's saying okay. He's trying to say three. There you go, kid. Okay. In 1985, Robert Sternberg developed the triarchic theory of intelligence. Analytical intelligence, academic ability, problem-solving skills, encoding information, combining and comparing pieces of information, generating a solution. Creative intelligence uh, was one of his uh, three uh, types of intelligence, and the other is practical intelligence. Creative intelligence is creativity and insight, and practical, intelli practical intelligence is street smarts, the ability to adapt to one's environment. Academic ability, street smarts, creativity. Howard Gardner is the present guru of multiple intelligences. Language, musical, these are the types of intelligences that he's come up with. Language, musical intelligence, logical, mathematical intelligence, spatial relations, skills, interpersonal uh, in, uh, intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence, bodily kinesthetic intelligence, naturalist intelligence, and existential intelligence. Creativity is the ability to do things that are novel and useful. Creative people take chances, do not accept limits, and attempt the impossible. Appreciate art and music. Use materials around them to make unique things. Challenge the social norms. Take an unpopular stand. Probe ideas. These are all forms of creativity. Creative people tend to be divergent thinkers. Divergent thinkers react to the stimulus with several different ways of looking at the problem. They tend to come up with several different solutions. Unfortunately, our means of education seems to seek the opposite type of thinking from di divergent thinking. Convergent thinking is where everyone is forced to come up with the same answer for the same question. In 1904, the major psychologist at the Sorbonne in Paris, Albert Benet, I'm sorry, Alfred Benet, teamed up with a medical intern, Theophile Simon, to develop a test to be used with children entering school to determine if they could handle the rigors of the French school system. This test was known as the Benet-Simon test and would become the first intelligence test. And this is Alfred Benet, by the way. In 1916, Lewis Terman from Stanford University adapted the, the Binet-Simon uh, test for use in the United States. Terman would spend the rest of his life studying bright children and started the Talented and Gifted movement. David Wexler was one of the psychologists who worked with Lewis Terman on the Alpha and Beta test during World War I. Wexler was well aware of the deficiencies in the military IQ test and began working on improving the concept. In 1934, Wexler published the first of a series of intelligence majors. Okay, the, the, okay. so Terman had to uh, come up with a, an intelligence test so we could place soldiers in the army correctly so that the officers were 
smart and the NCOs were not quite as smart and the uh, the enlisted personnel, the, the privates and corporals, uh, they were the ones that were the least intelligent. Unlike the Stanford Binet, which only gives a single score, the Wexler also gives subscores that indicate verbal ability and performance ability. A Wexler intelligence test will provide three scores, verbal a verbal, a verbal score, a performance score, and a general score. Wexler did not compare a person's chronological age with their mental age, but a person's score with their peer group. And that's, uh, okay, that's, when I was a kid, we, we all took the Stanford Binet. Normal distribution of intelligence shows that out of every 100 students, 68 will have average intelligence levels around 100. 13 will have an IQ between 68 and 82, balanced by 13 people with IQs between 116 and 132. Two people will have IQs between 52 and 68, balanced by two people with IQs between 132 and 148. One person will be below 52 and one will be above 148. And that's the normal distribution of intelligence. One aspect of, of most tests that are readily noticed is that the questions and references are culturally based. Because of this, most psychometricians recognize that IQ tests tend to be culturally biased. Most IQ tests in the United States are based on middle-class culture. Researchers trying to determine whether intelligence is inherited or developed, uh, dis, uh, or developed discovered that genetic influences account for between 60, 40 and 60 percent of the degree of intelligence. The rest seems to be environmental factors that include amount of stimulation during the formative years and level of nutrition. Learning disabilities are cognitive disorders that affect different areas of cognition, particularly language or reading. Learning disabilities are considered specific neurological impairments rather than the global intellectual or developmental disabilities. One confounding aspect of learning disabilities is that they most often affect children with average to above average intelligence. The disability is specific to a particular area and not a measure of overall intellectual ability. At the same time, learning disabilities tend to exhibit comorbidity with other disorders like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, also known as ADHD. Anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of individuals with diagnosed cases of ADHD also have some sort of learning disability. Children with dysgraphia have a learning disability that results in a struggle to write legibly. The physical tasks of writing with a pen and paper is extremely challenging for the person. These children often have extreme difficulty putting their thoughts down on paper. Based on the child's IQ and or abilities in other areas, a child with dysgraphia should be able to write but can't. Children with dysgraphia may also have problems with spatial abilities. Students with dysgraphia need, to, uh, need academic ac uh, accommodations to help them succeed in school. These accommodations can provide students with alternative assessment opportunities to demonstrate what they know. A student with dysgraphia might be permitted to take an oral exam rather than a traditional paper and pencil test. Treatment is usually provided by an occupational therapist, although there is some question as to how effective such treatment is. Dyslexia is the most common learning disability in children. An individual with dyslexia exhibits uh, an inability to correctly process letters. The neurological mechanism for sound processing does not work properly in someone with dyslexia. As a result, dys dyslexic children may not understand sound letter correspondence. A child with dyslexia may mix up letters within words and sentences. Letter reversals are a hallmark of this learning disability. 
or skip whole words while reading. A dyslexic child may have difficulty spelling words correctly while writing. Because of the disordered way that the brain processes letters and sound, learning to read is a frustrating experience. Some dyslexics, dyslexic, <laughs> dyslexic Individuals cope by memorizing the shapes of most words, but they never actually learn to read. Dyscalculia is difficulty is difficulty in learning or comprehending arithmetic. This learning disability is often first evident when children exhibit difficulty discerning how many objects are in a small group uh, without counting them. Other symptoms may include struggling to memorize math facts or orga uh, organize numbers or fully differentiate between numerals, math symbols, and written letters, such as three and three. And that is the end of the chapter. Good, because I was... <laughs>